Thank you, and welcome to this uh, first uh, talk in our uh, fourth series of expert briefings that PDF, the Parkinson's Disease Foundation, has been running now for the last four years. Uh, the title of this talk is What's New in Genetics and Parkinson's? Always one of the most popular and interesting and challenging of the topics, and um, it's no surprise that we're welcoming already almost a 1,000 people who have pre-registered for, uh, for this talk, and others will be joining us, so we welcome them all. And um, it's, um, I also want to make a, a couple of announcements of, of gratitude. First of all, for our sponsors, we have two companies, um, Abbott Laboratories and Teva Neuroscience, who have been sponsoring this series. We're very grateful to both of them. The responsibility for the series, of course, is entirely ours, but the responsibility for funding is, uh, has been mostly theirs, and we certainly appreciate this. Uh, the series of um, educational seminars is only part of the work that PDF does. If you're unfamiliar with our work and you'd like to check in with it, please visit our website at www.pdf.org. It's the shortest domain name in the business. And check us out and see if there's anything else you'd like to be in touch with us about. Um, it's my great pleasure now to introduce our um, guest speaker today, Dr. Matthew Farrer. Um, he is the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Neurogenetics and Translational Neuroscience at the University of British Columbia in Canada. Um, he was previously for many years at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville in Florida um, and is uh, really one of the, uh, the outstanding uh, genetics uh, specialists in the Parkinson's uh, field uh, in any country. And we're just thrilled uh, to have him here um, today. Um, he will speak for about 35, 40 minutes. You're probably familiar with this, those of you who've been with us before, to slides, and then we will have uh, time for questions afterwards. So please don't be bashful in emailing us your questions. Um, and we have a, a, a team of two here who will be quickly going through them and preparing them for me then to edit and uh, combine and, and uh, direct them to Dr. Farah uh, in the last part of the show today. So welcome. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Farah. This is really a great privilege for us. He's an altogether wonderful leader, and uh, the only possible um, misgiving I have about a total accolade here is he has a rather strange accent which betrays the homeland that we share. Okay. Thanks Dr. very Farah. much, Robin, for the introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the genetic world in, in Parkinson's disease. And, uh, there's a lot of ground to cover, so I'm, I'll, I'll get right to it. Um, first of all, I think it would help the listeners to appreciate why we're doing this and what genetic has in terms of what, what can it contribute to our understanding of Parkinson's disease. And, um, and really, I'm going to preface that with, uh, with, with uh, talking about the symptoms and, and the treatments for Parkinson's disease. As many know, um, levodopa, the main treatment for Parkinson's disease uh, works very well, but it doesn't work uh, forever. It, uh, um, and it is associated with uh, disabling side effects and, uh, and problems. And, and also patients uh, tend to progress in their disease and uh, tend to have to take more levodopa with time uh, and have more fluctuations and perhaps more problems uh, um, during the course. What we're after is to try and find a better understanding of what's really going wrong in the, in, in the disorder uh, in the brain and, uh, and what are the fundamental causes of that. Uh, um, what we'd like to do is to really to help, well, two things. One is to predict and the other is to, to prevent uh, Parkinson's disease in its progression, uh, pre perhaps prevent it altogether, um, you know, in, in, for instance, individuals who may be more susceptible to the disease. So I'm going to tell you about three things, not necessarily in the, in the order on the slide, but we're going to discuss the, the latest findings in genetic research of Parkinson's disease more towards the end of the talk. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what genetics research, or how to interpret genetic findings in Parkinson's disease more towards the beginning of the talk. And, and throughout the talk, I'm going to tell you about the new treatments and the excitement there is um, in developing uh, 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 new medications around these targets. In, in big pharmaceutical industries. So I'll move on to the next slide. Um, can I control this? Okay. Okay, so um, <clears throat> hopefully you should see this slide for the analogy here I've drawn is with, with a car engine. And um, 
And really, this is the problem. I, I think in Parkinson's disease, we don't really understand what the components are. For instance, if you have a problem with your car and it just doesn't start in the morning um, or it's slow or sluggish, you know, you've got a pretty good road map. Uh, you can look under the hood, under the bonnet, and, uh, and, and see the different parts of the car engine, whether it's the spark plugs or the, um, or the carburetor or the, uh, the battery, and, uh, and you have a, a series of diagnostic checks that you can do to see, really, to pinpoint what the problem is. Uh, for instance, maybe it's a dead battery, and, uh, and you can quickly remedy that by putting in, charging it up or putting a new battery in the car, and lo and behold, it works again. You've, you've fixed the problem. In Parkinson's disease, we'd like to do the same thing. Um, it's not enough to, uh, to just uh, alleviate the symptoms, I think. So, um, so what I'm going to tell you about is how we're trying to basically find these different components of this, if you like, uh, motor for dopaminergic neurons uh, in particular, and, um, and then how, we're going, how these different components can then uh, provide new targets uh, for therapeutics to, uh, uh, to remedy the problem. So in the top left-hand corner there, I've got a picture of a car engine with all its component parts. And in the bottom right, I've got a, a cartoon of a neuron. So um, uh, the bottom part of the neuron here, um, I don't know if you can see the mouse on the screen, but the, uh, the main cell body of, of, of the neuron um, basically has lots of small processes or dendrites that stick out of it um, that receive input from other neurons, other set brain cells in the vicinity of that cell body. But it also has an axon, this long um, uh, f filament that basically reaches from, uh, when we're talking about dopaminergic neurons, from, from the um, substantia nigra, the black substance in the brain, all the way to the striatum, and the region of the brain that controls the initiation of movement. Um, so the, uh, the axon basically ends in a, in a synaptic uh, terminal here, uh, synaptic bouton. And typically, for a single dopaminergic neuron, they have something in the order of 300,000 of these terminal boutons uh, in the striatum that innervate the striatum. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very com I mean, this is a very simple cartoon for a very complex uh, cell. I've illustrated on the cell a number of the different genes that have now been implicated in Parkinson's disease. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the methodology, the way in which we find them. And, um, and then I'm going to tell you, but focus more on, on what we're doing now in terms of joining the dots. Okay, we find each of these components, be it the battery, be it some spark plugs, be it, you know, the... Uh, I don't know, the alternator, um, we're trying now to figure out how they connect together to make this engine run. Um, so in terms of the um, approaches that we use, uh, there are two. It's quite simple, really. Linkage and association. And, um, and the findings, depending on which method was, was used, ha, ha, which is used, ha, have um, different ramifications, and I'll illustrate that. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is that everybody with Parkinson's disease in the world can take part in genetic studies, and it would be phenomenal, absolutely amazing if they would. Um, we do these studies here in British Columbia. There are many, many groups around the world doing these types of studies. Um, I wouldn't think it's too much of a problem, maybe for epidemiologists, but not for geneticists to be engaged in uh, with more than one group uh, and perhaps even doing similar work, although you don't want to duplicate too much effort. But um, but it would be wonderful if everybody would, would get engaged, both uh, patients with Parkinson's disease, family members, as well as their spouses, their unaffected uh, spouses who would act as uh, normal subject controls. So the two methods are linkage versus association. And um, to give you some illustration, on the next slide, um, I show you on the left-hand side, these are the genes that have been implicated through linkage. And by that, mutations or single nucleotide changes, so one change out of the six billion nucleotides we inherit, maybe a, an adenosine to a cytosine, or we have four nucleotides, A's, G's, C's, and T's. And a change of one of these in one of these genes uh, may be the culprit for Parkinson's disease being inherited down the family line. So the first gene identified for Parkinson's disease was alpha-synuclein, SNCA, uh, is the acronym for it, the top one on the slide. The first mutation um, was a, uh, a guanine to adenine change at position 209, which led to an amino acid change of alanine to threonine at position 53. You don't have to remember these things. I have to remember these things. But um, 
But what I wanted to point out is the, the precision in understanding that this specific base, one of six billion nucleotides, is the culprit in these families, uh, in these affected family members uh, with this particular form of, of Parkinson's disease. So synuclein point mutations and, uh, um, were initially identified in families in Contursi, Italy, and in Greece. Um, <clears throat> but several other mutations, and I'll get to that, have been discovered since. There are many other genes on this list, as you can see, and, and um, each, each of these, uh, when you have mutations in these genes on the left-hand side, um, basically uh, are sufficiently um, deleterious, to put it that way, um, to, to basically promote the disease down the family line. So basically, for instance, an alpha-synuclein mutation in, in um, parents uh, gives rise to a 50% likelihood in the children of that parent that they will go on to manifest Parkinson's disease if they live long enough. So basically 50% of each generation may be affected, and uh, males and females equally. Uh, some of these mutations are inherited in a recessive fashion rather than dominant, like PINK1, DJ1, Parkin, whereby one in four individuals um, may be affected, and neither parent may be, seem to be affected. Basically, they both carry... Um, mutations, but you need to inherit two uh, mutant copies of the, uh, of the gene, one from your mom, one from your dad, to manifest the disease. On the right-hand side <coughs> are susceptibility loci for Parkinson's disease. And I <coughs> these are found through association, not through linkage. And basically, this is a different technique. So instead of doing a family-based study, this is a study where many, many people with Parkinson's disease and many, many, many control subjects basically contribute DNA samples <clears throat> to very large studies, typically involving tens of thousands of people. Um, and basically, we look for differences in the frequency of variants, common variants that we all have, um, but we see whether these frequencies are most different between pa people with Parkinson's disease and people without the condition. Um, and this is nominated now something in the order of around 20 different uh, regions of the human genome in Parkinson's disease, uh, some of which include uh, genes on the left-hand side that are deleterious and for which we know that single-point mutations can also segregate down the family line. Um, you can get an update on both of these things. Uh, basically, if you look at gene tests, it's an NIH-sponsored site, uh, you can find out more about predictive genetic testing for Parkinson's disease, four mutations that segregate down the family line. Um, whereas if you look at, for instance, uh, PD gene, um, on the right-hand side, you can get an up-to-date uh, meta-analysis uh, of uh, all of the variants that have been implicated in Parkinson's disease through uh, candidate gene and genome-wide association studies. I should say that the genes on the left, uh, you know, because they segregate down the family line, the mutations on the left um, uh, basically have a, a larger contribution towards disease risk. The genes on the right typically have a rather small contribution uh, to disease risk. They may double the odds of getting the disease, for example. Um, but if the odds of getting the disease are only three in a thousand anyway, so the odds have been doubled are six in a thousand, it's, it's uh, relatively small uh, increases in risk. But nevertheless, these, uh, these findings are, are very interesting to, uh, to the neuroscience community. I um, thought I'd better talk about a little bit about personalized medicine and how genetics affects it. And the illustration I was going to give, because I think it might come up as a question, is, is, is around the idea of, of, of a lot of these uh, new companies that are popping up that do direct-to-consumer genetic testing. Um, I think this is, an, a, is, a, is a noble effort, really, uh, for the most part. Basically, you can send your DNA to a company like Navigenics or Decode Me or 23andMe. There's a number of different companies that do this. And for a small fee, they will basically run... Um, some, a series of genetic tests, typically one million genetic tests, and look at common variability, and maybe give you some predictions about um, your health and, uh, and possibly about um, predictions about uh, diseases that you may acquire during your lifetime. Now, for the most, time, for the most part, these genetic tests, uh, these companies, are basically looking at common variants. And as I said, these are susceptibility loci, and they don't, the variants that they are examined don't um, uh, necessarily segregate with disease down the family line. For the most part, they don't. And a recent study I should point out, this was done by uh, Negatel and uh, published in Nature in 2009, basically took the same individuals 
and, and sent these individuals' DNA samples to a variety of different companies, including 23andMe and Navigenics and a couple of others, and, uh, and basically looked at their predictions uh, based on this genetic testing uh, around disease risk and showed that for the most part, um, the tests either disagreed, um, as you can see here, uh, in terms of, for instance, this, ver this individual female A, her risk for psoriasis predicted by one company said it was less than the, um, than the relative risk of the population, and the other company said it was more. Um, sometimes the companies agreed, sometimes, uh, um, you know, but 50% of the time they disagreed in, disagreed in, the, in their risk estimates. So uh, this is a problem with the specific variants that are tested. Um, it's like I say, aren't that deleterious, aren't that pathogenic, don't segregate down the family line. But nevertheless, in very, very large studies involving tens of thousands of people, can be informative in aggregate um, when you're looking at the, the frequency differences across thousands of people. Um, I'm going to focus most of my, uh, my work on, on mutations that segregate down the family line because I think they can be much more informative about uh, um, what the fundamental causes of Parkinson's disease are and, uh, and much, more, uh, much more useful, if you like, for, as targets for, uh, for neuroscience and for the pharmaceutical industry to develop new drugs. Any neuroscience we do, we want to build upon the most solid foundation we can. And, uh, and I think genetics provides uh, that foundation. So genetics became a focus of Parkinson's disease around, uh, really around 1997, 98. So it's only really been going for the last decade or so. So it's fairly new discoveries. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about which, some of the genes that were discovered and illustrate those uh, with synuclein and LERC2 and, and illustrate why it matters as well. The field has really, really changed um, over the last few years and uh, you'll see why. So the first gene, as I mentioned, was alpha synuclein. It was discovered in uh, a family from Contursi, Italy, initially. It was this particular change here, A53T, found in lots of Greek families, too. And, um, and they were all shown to have this particular mutation, and they all developed uh, late-onset uh, Lewy body, Parkinson's disease. So Lewy bodies are the pathologic hallmark of Parkinson's disease, the um, inclusions that are found in cells in the brain when a person uh, dies. Since then... A number of other point mutations have been found, A30P initially in a German family, uh, and then uh, E46K in, in, some, in families from, from, uh, from Spain. Uh, and most recently, we've actually found another mutation, H50Q, uh, in British Columbia in, in the center where I work. And, uh, and I think, it's, uh, I understand, the same mutation has been identified in Queen Square in London in, in a family there, too. So there are still more mutations to be identified in our snooping. All of the mutations tend to line up, I don't want to go too much into the biology, but along one side of this helix of the alpha synuclein protein. And that informs us a little bit about its function and what these mutations were doing. Um, however, the, um, some of the big excitement came um, because very quickly after the alpha synuclein protein so gene uh, was identified, antibodies uh, to the protein, so reagents that, that will stain the protein, uh, were created and were used uh, in some post-mortem studies, some autopsy-based studies, to look at individuals who had Parkinson's disease during life. And what was observed was all of this brown pigmented staining. You can see it here. So here is a typical um, picture of a Lewy body. This is a Lewy body, a protein inclusion in the nigra, in the substantia nigra, of a person with Parkinson's disease. And this um, inclusion is this brown staining, actually all of this brown staining that you see on the slide here, is abnormal and should not be present. Um, but it showed us very quickly that these genetic findings in a single family initially from Contursi, Italy, um, can be generalized to uh, garden variety, typical Parkinson's disease around the globe. Because basically this now, this staining, alpha synuclein staining, has become the, uh, the pathologic hallmark of Parkinson's disease the world over. It's led to... Um, a better understanding of, this, of, of where Parkinson's disease may begin. And uh, Heiko Brack has, has a very nice hypothesis suggesting that it may start either in the gut, uh, in the myenteric plexus in the gut, where you first see Lewy pathology based on synuclein staining, or it might start in the olfactory bulb. And, uh, and then ascend basically into the, uh, into the brain stem, uh, midbrain, and subsequently perhaps into limbic and cortical regions of the brain. Um, 
it tells us a little bit about Parkinson's disease progression. The, um, the big discovery came, I think, in part from for synuclein with the identification of synuclein multiplication mutations that were published back in 2003 to start with. A series of them have come through since then. And these show that um, a simple 50% uh, increase of dose of alpha-synuclein or 100% increase of dose of alpha-synuclein, depending on whether you've inherited one extra copy or two extra copies, is sufficient to, uh, to cause Parkinson's disease down the family line. And that increase in dose, as you can see here from this little part of the slide, um, basically is associated not just with the age of onset, uh, but also the, uh, the comorbidities or the other features that may be associated with, uh, with the movement disorder. So a 50% increase in dose typically manifests with Parkinson's disease around 55 years of age. Um, uh, so it should be this figure I'm looking to, symptomatic synuclein duplication carrier, uh, whereas a um, four copies, or what we call a synuclein triplication, I know it's confusing, um, but four copies of alpha-synuclein will, um, will lead to an even earlier onset of, of Parkinson's disease. So basically, these genetic findings taught us the mechanism that increases in alpha-synuclein can c contribute directly to the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease and led us to start thinking about ways in which we could lower alpha-synuclein expression. And uh, several companies now um, have been uh, formed uh, or are working on this particular agenda, uh, many of the large pharmaceutical companies, to developing methods in which um, they can lower uh, synuclein expression. Um, neuroscience, as well, has proceeded to try and, try and understand what synuclein is the protein itself is actually doing, because it's kind of like that alternator in the car. car. You've got to try and figure out what that component of the car engine is really doing. If you're going to try and understand how it connects to other components in the car engine or other genes that might be identified, for instance, in families um, with mutations uh, uh, with Parkinson's disease. So we now know that, for instance, alpha-synuclein um, is involved in um, maintaining uh, vesicles. So these are very small uh, membranous uh, structures that are found in those presynaptic terminals I mentioned earlier. Uh, they typically package neurotransmitters, such as dopamine in dopaminergic neurons, and allow those neurotransmitters to be released when, they, uh, when this, these little vesicles uh, fuse against the plasma membrane and release that neurotransmitter into the space between neurons to allow signaling communication from one cell to another. The issue with alpha-synuclein is that it helps um, stabilize these vesicular structures. And, um, and we believe it's got a role not just in, in maintaining the, uh, um, what's known as the readily releasable pool of synaptic vesicles and dopaminergic neurons, but we think it may also have a role in the uh, reverse uh, phenomenon, which is basically how these membrane structures then basically form back into vesicles again after they've released their neurotransmitter into the synaptic space, how they basically uh, uh, form once more and, uh, and, and then are available again for, uh, to package new neurotransmitter. Again, I don't want to go too much into the details. I think it might be a bit too much, but um, this membrane uh, basically in neurons is critical. Um, the, uh, it's polarized. It carries an electric current. Um, it has thousands, uh, if not tens of thousands, of very specific uh, receptors. Um, it has to be exquisitely maintained, and, um, and its constituents have to be maintained. And this process of basically membrane formation and membrane uh, recycling, uh, around vesicular recycling, um, I think is one of the um, central tenets of Parkinson's disease that is becoming more and more of a focus uh, in terms of uh, what the genes are telling us. Um, moving on to uh, the next major gene for Parkinson's disease is leucine neutropenic kinase 2, LERC2. And this was a staggering advance um, in many ways because, really for the most part, because of its frequency, so many people in the world have LERC2 mutations or have common variability, genetic variability. So LERC2 is also a susceptibility locus, not just a, uh, a um, uh, link to disease but also associated with the disease. So many people with Parkinson's disease have uh, variability in LOC2 that contributes to their condition. Um, so therefore, uh, studies on it are, are very important uh, in terms of if we can develop therapies for LOC2 uh, patients. I think they're probably going to be generalizable to people 
with garden variety Parkinson's disease. The first family identified that I was working out with was uh, from western Nebraska. You can see here, uh, Parkinson's disease segregates down the family line. These are kind of the, um, the forefathers uh, of the, of the uh, pedigree here. Individuals in black have Parkinson's disease. This is that person's spouse. They went on to have uh, several daughters, daughter here, daughter there, daughter, several, actually, I think it's uh, uh, five affected daughters and one unaffected daughter with Parkinson's disease. And you can see how Parkinson's disease segregates down the family line. Several autopsies conducted uh, from uh, the generous gift of family members when they died and uh, showed that um, these in the family had both uh, Park Lewy body Parkinson's disease as well as uh, tau Parkinsonism. So, uh, so um, again, I shouldn't go into too much due to time forbids, but uh, I'll move on. Um, one of the things that we quickly discovered, uh, this, so I should say, this, this mutation, first of all, uh, was an, an R1441C mutation in leucinorytropy kinase 2. Uh, we quickly discovered many other mutations, and probably the, the most exciting um, to the field has been this particular variant, G2019S. Um, we first found this in, in uh, families from the coast of uh, northern Norway, a uh, series now around 13 kindreds. Um, and uh, realized quite quickly, of course, that they're all related. But in the first paper, we highlighted there are other families in the United States with this mutation. Perhaps they were Norwegian emigrants. Uh, we also found individuals um, in Ireland, from Ireland, and also Poland with the same uh, mutation. And not just the same mutation, but the same piece of DNA around that mutation. So these individuals, whether they were skiing in Norway or eating you know, sauerkraut in Poland, um, it occurred to us they all are descended from a common ancestor, a common forefather. Um, inheriting a G2019S mutation increases the risk of Parkinson's disease by around tenfold, um, but, and it is very common in some parts of the world. We um, the autopsy series that were done showed that the majority of people with G2019S low to Parkinsonism had typical Lewy body Parkinson's disease, um, as you can see here, both in the uh, um, in the midbrain and the substantia nigra, but also in the uh, factory bulb and also in the gut lining. They also had some nuclear pathology, typical for Parkinson's disease. The, um, we quickly learned in 2006 with these papers coming out that, um, that the spread of G2019S was actually much further afield than just Norway down th through uh, sort of northern Europe to Poland, if you like. Um, it was shown that in Ashkenazi uh, Jews, 14% uh, of patients of Ashkenazi origin have a LERC2 G2019S mutation. And uh, across the coast of North Africa, all the way from Morocco over here to uh, Algeria, uh, Tunisia, L Libya here, um, that uh, Arab Berbers in, in these populations, uh, typically one in three patients that comes into the clinic, um, for instance in Tunisia, has a LERC2 G2019S mutation, which is a major risk factor for them developing the disease. We ascribe this, and it's a, just a hypothesis, but um, to the Phoenician Empire and, uh, and the trading of this uh, seafaring nation ac across the Med. And there's a picture here of Queen Dido, if you're interested, and, and, and Carthage, which is one of the major um, trading uh, settlements, um, which helped to spread, if you like, this mutation. And the Vikings perhaps had some, uh, some role in this, uh, um, but I stick to genetics, I think. In terms of risk estimates, we've estimated this in Tunisia in the Arab Berber population background. And we find here that principally if, um, if you're a carrier of the disease, by the time you reach 70 years of age and you're a gene carrier, your risk of becoming affected is around 80%. It's a very high risk in, in uh, Berber Arabs uh, from Tunisia. Um, however, other studies have been done in, in uh, America and Europe and find risk estimates that are much, much lower. And there's a nice little uh, review of this by uh, Stefano Goldworm in Movement Disorders in 2011. And the risk estimates are quite variable depending on the ethnic background and the study design that was used. Many of these studies, however, are very small, very few numbers of patients, underpowered, and I think conclusions, you know, the confidence intervals are quite wide. The, um, We've been doing some more studies in Tunisia, a much larger population series, because of the prevalence of uh, C2019S. It is such a major uh, health burden in that part of the world. And, uh, 
And we find that we can reproduce our risk estimates. So again, here you can see age on this axis. You can see the risk of developing the disease um, around, around 70 years of age, your risk of getting the disease is up here in the you know, 80% kind of people with, at 70 years of age. The median age of onset for Parkinson's disease, if you're allergic to your carrier, will be affected. We're doing studies in families uh, with the help of many, many, I think more than 200 families in, uh, in Tunisia are engaged in this and all their family members. We find similar risk estimates within the family-based studies. The, um, in terms of common variability, this is a study we did last year in 2011, engaging 15,000 subjects took part in this study, and we looked at all of the common variability in LERC2, so not necessarily pathogenic mutations, they were excluded, but common uh, variability, common changes in nucleotide changes within the gene, and sure enough showed that there are many, many uh, uh, risk factors, single point uh, variants that are frequently found in many different populations that contribute either uh, to disease risk or to actually to brain health, making this an incredibly exciting target for the pharmaceutical industry uh, because the treatment they develop is likely to be generalizable. Um, mouse models have been made, and there are many, many, many now mouse models of Parkinson's disease. So one thing is finding the gene, the next, and the mutation. The next is trying to understand what it does, how it does, and making a model that will inform uh, the development of a drug to, uh, to put the condition right. This is one of the mouse models we made around LERC2. Actually, no, it wasn't our group, actually, I misspeak. Uh, it was uh, CJ Lee's group and uh, developed the, an R1441G uh, LERC2 mouse model. This is a mutation that's particularly prevalent in, uh, in the Basque community of northern Spain, and the mice develop um, a, a motor phenotype, a movement disorder, and they also develop, uh, in this case, tau pathology and also have problems in, in dopamine release. Um, so they recapitulate many aspects of the disease. Since then, many drug companies have started to get involved in academia, of course, too, is, is driving this, and the Fox Foundation, I should give them some credit for this. They've also been pushing this agenda very hard to developing uh, inhibitors of, uh, of LERC2 kinase um, with the view that if we can hit the, um, the idea is LERC2 kinase is overactive, and if you can inhibit the, the kinase portion of the molecule, you may actually be able to slow down the progression of the disease. I'm going to move on to most recent genetic insights because I've probably been talking too long, but um, I wanted to highlight uh, a common theme, joining the dots between these genetic players. So I talked about Sanuclein and Lurk, but I haven't talked about the three or four latest genes in Parkinson's disease. And uh, this is the first one I'll mention. It's, uh, it's called known as VPS35. It's a protein that's involved in... Uh, synaptic vesicle membrane recycling. And uh, we're particularly interested in, um, and, uh, in, uh, in its role in, in what's known as the retromere. So this is a quite complicated, but it's basically a pathway within neurons that helps to recycle membrane and membrane-associated proteins uh, within the neuron. We're focused uh, in those presynaptic terminals, but you can look, a lot of the biology of this has actually been done in the cell body uh, and, and in non-neuronal cells. And um, this is the first thing that came out last year and has been reproduced. Uh, so there are quite a lot of families now with VPS35 uh, mutations. We've recently described another mutation in the gene known as DNAJC13, also known as REMI8, um, receptor-mediated endocytosis 8 in families of Mennonite descent, again with late-onset typical Lewy body Parkinson's disease. The picture here is of Rembrandt, who may or may not have been, but is uh, alluded to have been a Mennonite, uh, one of the, the earliest Mennonites. The, um, and then um, there's a paper, a fairly recent paper, of a very small family that came out in PLOS1 just fairly recently of another DNAJC mutation uh, in a different DNAJC, uh, DNAJC6, again involved in this process of synaptic vesicle uh, or membrane uh, protein a membrane vesicle, membrane protein recycling. Um, so we're starting to get what I think is a, uh, a common picture, and here's an illustration of it, of what's going on in Parkinson's disease in terms of its cellular pathogenesis. And uh, some folks have been focused up here in terms of synuclein, for instance, and uh, stabilization of snares, and perhaps synuclein's role in, in maintaining synaptic vesicle, uh, vesicles in this area. Uh, others are interested in these tubular-like structures, the VPS35 and the retromere, 
Uh, a lot of work is focused up here on lysosome and the, degregate, and the breakdown of alpha-synuclein aggregates uh, that you find in Lewy bodies um, in Parkinson's patients. So basically, principally, uh, LERC2, I should point out, is, is found here, and it's involved in the sorting of proteins in the trans-Golgi network to different parts of neurons. But principally, all of the proteins, all of the genes that encode proteins in Parkinson's disease fall along this common uh, pathway. And, uh, and I think it's becoming clearer and clearer what the picture is in terms of how to join the dots, how this motor actually functions, and what are the connecting routes between the, the major components of it, each of which becomes um, a drug target. Um, so the last thing I'm going to illustrate is how advances in genome sequencing will speed up the development of new treatments and how you uh, or people with Parkinson's disease or people interested in helping people with Parkinson's disease can help. And um, that's really to point out there's been a real revolution in genome sequencing, um, tremendous uh, revolution uh, in the last three years. It's now possible, and we're doing this in our lab, to sequence hundreds if not thousands of genes in a single experiment and to look at all of the variability and how it contributes, uh, for instance, to human health or to human disease. Uh, this illustrates a panel, for instance, that we've made that captures all of the genes uh, in which uh, mutations have been found that are linked to neurodegeneration in general, not just Parkinson's disease, but dementia, motor neuron disease, for instance, and peripheral neuropathies. <clears throat> they can be assayed in a single experiment for, and we're doing this for something in the order of about $150 per subject, very, very cheaply to, to identify uh, risk variants for disease. And working with these individuals uh, um, and their family members, we're starting to get a really clear picture of, um, of genetic and clinical uh, correlations, and also correlations with treatment and treatment outcomes in those individuals. And this is something that's going to be a long-term effort, a longitudinal effort. It's going to involve many, many people and many, many families, um, and the generous gift of their time and data um, and DNA samples, blood samples, but ultimately will, I think, give us the, like I said earlier, the, the solid foundation that we need for, for neuroscience advances and for therapeutic advances to, uh, to really stop this disease's uh, progression, not just to create drugs that are good for the symptomatic effects of Parkinson's disease, but drugs that actually slow its progression or stop its progression in its, in its tracks and, uh, in effect, um, provide a cure for the disease. So I think leave that with uh, some questions and answers. Okay. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Farah. That was really superb, and uh, we all appreciate it speaking on behalf of our entire audience today. I know that they will agree with me. This is a wonderful talk, much appreciated. Um, we already have quite a number of good questions in. Uh, you're invited to send others. If we don't get to them by the end, we will certainly try to get back to you later. Um, I have taken the editorial liberty of not including all of them because um, some of them were submitted before Dr. Farah's talk, and I think they were well answered during it. So if you don't hear yours, don't think I'm ignoring it, but I think it was probably well covered. Um, there's a group of questions, Dr. Farrell, to kick this part off, that I think um, uh, clearly show there's a tremendous interest among our uh, people in our audience today in how they can go about participating in research, which of course is music to your ears, and you've said that in several different ways. One kind of question asked by three people is um, uh, the, the commercial uh, services. You talked about 23andMe. You talked about another couple of them. Uh, another question from another person was, what about medical centers? Instead of going to a uh, commercial service that will give you a, a personalized report on your, um, on your genetic risk, uh, you would then go to a medical center, which, uh, like the University of British Columbia, which has a, uh, a sterling um, uh, genetics program and uh, give your DNA there and, sub and, and contribute to their research in that way. Um, do you have uh, any additional comments, additional to those you already made, on what one would do if one would like to participate in research, would like to contribute DNA to this whole thing? What sorts of places would you, if you were in that situation, go to first? Um, well, yeah, very good question. So. I'm really interested in, in getting uh, neurologists uh, as part of the, the equation. One of the, I think, problems or challenges with direct-to-consumer companies and, and that type of genetic uh, approach is, is that it kind of uh, 
marginalizes the role of the neurologist in both the diagnosis of the disease and, and the follow-up uh, uh, exams, and of course in, in, in terms of the treatment. And uh, so I'm, I'm really keen to uh, get individuals uh, to take part through academic medical centers. There are a number of big groups doing genetic work in Parkinson's disease, and a quick Google search on Parkinson's disease genetics, and um, we'll probably give you a handful of these. They're scattered around the world. Um, I'm part of a consortium known as the GOPD, G-E-O-P-D, uh, which basically is working right now with something in the order of, um, uh, I forget the number, but it's, it's kind of like uh, 20 or 30 different countries around the world, uh, something in the order of 60 or 70 different major neurology centers in those countries, and currently engaging more than 60,000, maybe 70,000 um, uh, individuals in, in the studies. Um, from my own personal point of view, the, uh, we don't have all the money in the world and we don't have uh, all the time, um, but my center is incredibly interested in individuals who may have atypical Parkinson's disease, atypical forms. Um, we're very interested in individuals who have a family history. I should say one in seven people with Parkinson's disease have a family history of the condition, typically in a first degree relative. We're very interested in hearing from, from you. And um, to get engaged in the studies, we, we have a worldwide uh, um, you know, consortium. Uh, we may not be able to uh, see you directly, but we certainly have a, a friend, a colleague, probably in, in, a, in, a, in a country and a town near you <laughs> who, who could, we could recommend and, and uh, suggest that you hook up with um, to get engaged in, in uh, our study or related studies in those centers. So it's, um, it's pretty easy, actually, to get involved. Um, Great. Thank you so much. Um, this uh, second question is really a subset of the first, but it will be a quicker one, I think, for you to answer. That is, a gentleman is calling and saying he's heard that there's an age limit on the uh, usefulness of, uh, um, of participation in trials like this. He's heard, and I don't know where he lives. This particular person didn't identify that, but he's 80 years old, and he's wondering, is there any age limit uh, uh, that, would, uh, the, that would limit the, the people who could actually participate in a research study, genetic research study? Um, not in a genetic research study, no. Um, perhaps from a clinical trials point of view and a medication study, yes. Uh, and often medication clinical trials are looking for de novo or new patients who are very recently diagnosed and perhaps have not been on uh, therapies. So one of the problems for, for a lot of uh, research studies is, is that taking medication for Parkinson's disease can, can cloud uh, some of the uh, answers to the questions that our investigators are looking at. But medications don't affect your DNA, uh, not the DNA that you inherit. And uh, so, no, um, people of all ages can participate in genetic studies. One, one caveat is that it becomes increasingly more difficult to diagnose Parkinson's disease in the very, very elderly. Uh, so that that's um, an 80-year-old, I think, is a fairly young man. Uh, so, but in the very elderly, it um, becomes more difficult to diagnose. People are, are less active and less mobile generally, and it becomes more difficult to make the call and the diagnosis. But, uh, but that's the only caveat. Thank you. Um, every good group has its ringers, and I strongly suspect that I know the identity of the person who asked this question. I right. may even out him. I think it is Dr. Heidrich from Washington, D.C., and if I'm wrong, he will, uh, he will uh, scold me afterwards. But his, his question, uh, he's an MD, by the way, so that's why he's a ringer. He asks, can gene expression be altered by nutritional practice? Um, um, well, almost certainly, I think. Yeah, people often ask me, what, what would you do? I mean, it's all very nice studying these genes and finding these mutations and setting up these models and pushing the pharma industry to create therapies. Well, what can I do immediately in my lifetime to have some benefit? And um, the answer to that, really, I, I think you've had a show on it previously, is exercise. Uh, I think exercise is one of the best neuroprotective agents out there, if there is one. Um, I would say it's exercise and get engaged in you know, some sort of exercise program, whether it's uh, swimming or dance or, or something like that, I think is incredibly beneficial. So, yes, and I think exercise uh, probably does, and diet and nutrition does affect gene expression. One of the um, uh, central uh, issues in, in the, the, the genetics is pointing us to is, is this, what's known as endocytosis. Uh, one end of endocytosis is a process known as autophagy, how cells degrade proteins and basically help them to be turned over so new proteins are synthesized, old proteins are degraded, and the, the degradation machinery is known as the lysosome, 
Um, this breakdown of proteins, as well as the creation, the translation of new proteins, is regulated by something known as the mTOR pathway, uh, mammalian target rapamycin pathway, and, and that is uh, influenced very strongly by uh, nutrition and by exercise. So, um, so I, I think, yes, um, uh, that was a very good question. I think gene expression can be altered by diet, by nutrition, by exercise, with beneficial Great. for Parkinson's patients. Good. Thank you. Um, here's a question. I don't think you answered this. If you if you did, you'll forgive me. Um, gentlemen would like to know uh, what uh, of all people with Parkinson's, what percentage of them have a genetic history of the kind that you were listing, one or more of the genes that you were listing that are possibly inculpated in Parkinson's, compared with those who have no such genetic history. What's the, what's the ratio there? That's that's a really good question, and um, and it's increasing by the day. <laughs> so uh, it's a difficult to put a figure on, but um, in terms of family history, so that's not necessarily genetic, but because uh, families can be influenced by a common lifestyle, diet, for example. Um, but in terms of family history of Parkinson's disease, disease, it's one in seven individuals have a family history of Parkinson's disease, 14% or so, uh, with the re fairly recent Mayo Clinic study. Um, in terms of the number of those individuals that have a really serious deleterious pathogenic mutation uh, that segregates down the family line, it's only a handful, I would say something in the order of, uh, of 10%, something of those one in seven, all right, uh, at most, uh, so far. Um, in terms of common var var variability, so the susceptibility loci, which also sometimes happen to be the same as the pathogenic uh, genes, pathogenic mutation genes like synuclein, for instance, uh, uh, tau, uh, LERC2, um, many, many people with Parkinson's disease have those susceptibility loci. Uh, they make a small contribution to disease risk, but nevertheless um, are important players in terms of uh, the disease that that individual has. Many of the genetic forms of Parkinson's disease, I should have pointed out, uh, appear to be population specific. So when we, get in, get, when we often ask about ethnicity, a background, ethnic background, when we, uh, we ask when people get engaged in the studies that we're doing. And if people are from, for instance, northern Spain, we'll look for R1441G and look to, first of all, because it's something in the order of 10% of patients uh, with Parkinson's disease uh, in northern Spain uh, from the Basque region have an R1441G mutation. As I said, Berber Arabs, uh, so if they're Berber Arab origin from North Africa, one in three patients has a G2019S mutation. And that's not one in three patients with a family history, that's one in three patients in general has a, has a LERC2 mutation, a G2019S mutation specifically. In Asia, um, the risk factors like G2385R in LERC2 found in 8% of all Asians, and when I say Asia, I mean Japan, Korea, China, Singapore, across Asia, Taiwan, and uh, so, but those risk factors like G2385R perhaps only double the risk, they don't in the re increase the risk tenfold, but just double the risk, they're just susceptibility factors. So um, it's population specific, the frequencies are increasing um, as our knowledge increases, and so to define this and put a hard figure on it is very difficult. It's a moving target, but it's an increasing one. Thank you. Um, this is um, putting you on the spot a bit, and I realize it's an entirely unfair question, but it's the kind of question that we get at PDF a lot, which is um, if I have uh, one primary relative, mother, father, um, sister, brother, uh, with Parkinson's, what does that do to my risk? And it's a general answer we've had, which I hope is more or less right, that it may double your risk if there's a single primary relative, but it doubles it from a very small level, as you were pointing out earlier. Uh, this particular person, um, she is asking a very specific thing, which I realize has no specific answer, but I'd love to hear you take a whirl at it, Dr. Farah. Here's the situation, probably a family situation of her own. Two siblings, both have Parkinson's. One of the siblings has two children, and uh, they have uh, five children together. So one of the two siblings who has Parkinson's has five grandchildren. Uh, what generally, very generally, would be the risk, uh, the, the, the increased risk for those grandchildren? Well, it's, uh, I, I would say, to be honest, it, it's marginal. Um, until you actually pinpoint a, uh, um, the genetic factor driving that, uh, perhaps, uh, I mean, that, that familial aggregation, the reason these two siblings have the disease in the first place, 
I, I think it'd be very difficult to put a risk, fact, a risk estimate on it. And even when you do find a specific mutation, for instance, perhaps it's lurk 2 g 2019 s calculating what the risk would be in the offspring is also going to be incredibly challenging, but it's relatively low. Um, the biggest risk for Parkinson's disease, is, uh, which I should have pointed out at the beginning, is age. It's not genetics at all. Genetics really is the route into understanding this engine, if you like, uh, uh, this motor, uh, in the machine itself, and, and to what, what is the underlying uh, substrate, if you like, that, uh, that is resulting in Parkinson's disease, and what's going wrong in the cells. It's, um, we're not doing this genetic study really to inform individuals about personalized risk, and uh, because I don't think we can. I don't think we have enough information to do that. And for the most part, part Parkinson's disease is considered a, what we'd call a multifactorial condition. You still have to get you know, to 60 or 70 years of age before you develop the disease, and there's a lot of things on the way that can influence whether you will or whether you won't. So it's very hard to put uh, risk estimates on it. So I'm, I'm going to uh, fudge my way around the question and not answer it. <laughs> Probably um, very responsibly. And, and, uh, I think the, the point I want to make is that um, please get engaged in genetic research, but do it for the right reasons. I don't mm -hmm. think... Um, we, are, we like I say, we want to understand what's, what, it, what is the cellular pathogenesis of, of this disorder so we can fix it. Um, this is not about uh, defining uh, individual uh, risk. We're looking for people who are altruistic and philanthropic, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, um, who can make this uh, humanitarian gift, you know, really to, to society, to the world. Um, Getting something back like a hard and fast estimate on you know, exactly what my risk is going to be is, as I pointed out with the 23 in Navigenics uh, study that was published, or results that were published uh, in Nature, uh, this is very difficult to predict, and 50% uh, of the time the predictions are wrong. That's such a good point, and I'd like to generalize it, if I may, beyond the field that we're discussing today, the idea of participation in research being a philanthropic act. You know, too, so many of us think of it as something that can actually um, give us some direct benefit, and it'd be wonderful if it does, and it sometimes does. But given the number of trials in so many areas of Parkinson's that don't work out, um, the idea that going into the trial is somehow you've then failed because you haven't learned for yourself or you haven't got a new treatment for yourself, um, is um, uh, that sets you up for something that is often unrealistic. And at the bottom, it really is a generous act going into these trials. And the science, including the science that doesn't work, also teaches people like Dr. Farrow or something because failures teach as well as successes. So thank you for making that point about, um, about the uh, generosity. I think it's awfully important. I've combined three questions here, Dr. Farrow, into one, which I find very tantalizing. And it has to do with the different ways in which Parkinson's develops and the different ages at which it develops. Mm -hmm. And the questions, which I'm kind of making generic here, are uh, is this because of genetic subtypes? Is it that different ways in which Parkinson's manifests and different ages at which it is diagnosed, could these be traced in general, in part or in whole, to genetic differences? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. I think so. Um, we have good evidence for that for some genetic subtypes. Uh, so, for instance, uh, well, be too specific about it, but uh, for instance, individuals with pink one uh, homozygous mutations or compound heterozygous mutations tend to have very early onset Parkinson's. Parkinsonism, it's very slowly progressive, but it tends to be the akinetic, uh, rigid uh, form of Parkinson's, subtype of Parkinson's disease, rather than tremor dominant, which many are more familiar with. Um, and again, you know, it's, we understand uh, the primary risk factor, which is loss of pink one expression don't understand how that contributes necessarily uh, to, to that manifestation, but, um, but definitely the genetics under, underlie, does underlie subtypes. Other forms, for instance, synuclein variability has a major plot, role to play in cognitive um, aspects of Parkinson's disease and perhaps uh, more accelerated cognitive decline um, in patients with Parkinson's disease. So this is, uh, again, a subtype uh, of uh, Parkinson's disease with dementia. Uh, which is uh, promoted by synuclein variability. So, yes, there's the answer to that. And this is something that longitudinal effort, you know, long-term effort of engagement of patients, their neurologists, uh, their geneticists, <laughs> uh, their um, 
uh, a local medical center, a uh, collaborating center, as part of this major international effort is going to uh, address and answer. Because we can, taking this data over the course of an individual's disease, looking at the genetic profile, which doesn't change in your lifetime. You only have to have this sequencing done kind of once. Uh, but looking how that correlates with clinical progression and with outcomes, um, that's the data we're going to put together over the next 20 years or so. And, um, and I think we're going to have a, a much more rigorous and, and um, illuminating answer to that question in 20 years. Hopefully I'll be around to tell you. Right. Thank you. Um, there's, um, here's a question that um, I know that you're not a genetics counselor, uh, yet you seem to know about everything, so I'm going to ask it anyway. Here's a, a woman who is uh, a, a sad story here. She enrolled in good faith in a genetic testing program. She couldn't understand the results, couldn't find a counselor to help her, and the people mm -hmm. in charge didn't seem to be telling her very much unless she pushed them, and it turns out that you know she didn't get very much even after that. So do you have advice for people going into genetics uh, studies uh, who uh, find this kind of uh, ready smile at the front end but somehow a missing um, uh, reporter at the other end? Right. No, I, that is such a familiar story. I get it all the time from um, neurology colleagues who basically are present, you know, the, a patient comes into their office with their 23 and me results typically and says, what does this mean? And, uh, and, and you know, unveils this report of uh, all these risk factors. And, of course, the neurologist is dumbfounded by it for the most part. And uh, the patient really is none of the wiser. And uh, to be honest, I don't really think 23 and me and are much the wiser either, even though they provide the prediction in the first place. Um, it's going to take many years of effort. So I, I think the, um, you know, we're, we're kind of like, uh, I, I liken it to, we're like page one of Genesis when it comes to, to our understanding of how genetics influences uh, uh, human disease or human health or human traits. And uh, for the most part, we're very good at studying single gene disorders, and we can put family fairly good risk estimates on that. But typically what you get when you go to these direct-to-consumer companies is they're not testing for specific deleterious mutations in known genes. For instance, they cause Parkinson's disease, with maybe one or two exceptions. Um, they're testing common variability that we all have and looking for frequency differences. So uh, in the general population, maybe this variant is seen at 10%. Um, and... Uh, Maybe you you have it, and uh, and maybe it's it, it's very marginally in, you know uh, associated with an increased risk of a of a particular condition. Giving you a genetic counselling on that type of thing is uh, uh, is is actually meaningless. It doesn't it, it cannot be done. So I I, I think yeah, um, the general advice would be um, not to be cautious. Get engaged in genetic testing. Be very cautious if you're parting with money to do it. Um, you know, if someone's trying to ask, saying they're going to predict this stuff for you and, uh, and they're asking you to, um, to write a check uh, for a certain amount of money to, to do this, I'd be very cautious with that because I think for the most part we don't know. We are quite naive. And, um, and this is coming from an expert in genetics and Parkinson's disease in the field. <laughs> so uh, so I, um, I would be very cautious with, uh, with promises made at the forefront and, uh, and then the lack of delivery at the back end. Um, there are some very good genetic counseling services. So if you do, for instance, have a look to G2019S mutation, you should be able to get some reliable advice on that. Uh, one good place to look is Gene Tests, the website online. It's one word, I think, uh, if you write Gene Tests. It's an NIH-sponsored website that's run through Seattle. And uh, you can look up specific gene reviews, which will tell you about that particular gene, the mutations in it, and their contribution towards disease risks, as well as companies that do that type of testing uh, on a fee-for-service basis. It's not genetic counseling one-on-one, -on -one, but, um, but it's the best that we can do through the web kind of thing or remotely. So um, have a look at that. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Ferro. Um, this last comment actually prompts something, if you'll forgive a brief public service announcement for Parkinson Disease Foundation. We have a program, I know many of you on this, um, on this seminar are familiar with it, called Parkinson's Advocates and Research, which is a, um, a, now a four-year-old attempt, uh, a su very successful attempt, I must say, to create a leadership group of lay advocates in Parkinson's research. And one of the things they do, because we've come across this and it's prompted our concern in the past, is work with people who are running trials to make sure that the people who participate in the trials, including genetics trials, are given the best possible respect 
and treated mm. actually as partners in the enterprise. And uh, and this lady's uh, comment, very uh, uh, thoughtfully responded to uh, by Dr. Farah, is just one of those cases in point. And the research process doesn't seem to be quite regarding its main um, champions and participants, namely the people, uh, with the kind of respect uh, that they deserve, but also that will help advance the science and get more people involved. We have now 200 people in this um, ambassador group uh, um, working around the country in these areas. And it's, uh, it just reminds me how important this work is. Did you uh, have a comment on that, Dr. Farrow? Um, yeah, well, a few comments. Probably I've got comments on everything, but, <laughs> but I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, it's very difficult, though, on the other hand, to uh, to write to each individual and uh, tell them, you know, about advances. Uh, so what we what I tend to do, and our group does, we work with our local Parkinson's disease uh, support group uh, uh, here in British Columbia, and, and they they have a newsletter that they send out uh, every uh, th four months, and, and basically we provide material for the newsletter to say what's what's recent, uh, how uh, individuals have contributed, and how that's drive, driven the science forward and we write about very specific uh, genetic discoveries. If we find something deleterious in a person's genome related to the disease, we do uh, contact them and ask them if they want to know, um, you know with appropriate ethical consent from, uh, from our research ethics board. But I agree with you, getting um, individual participants and researchers uh, together and, and uh, engaging people uh, in this, and neurologists engaging them in this uh, long-term basically dialogue uh, of this interaction, which is what we have to do if we're going to move this forward, is critical. And one of the things I loved, um, and I know that you, you've got a big part to play in this, is, is, the, um, is the World Congresses of Parkinson's disease, where you've got this patient and, uh, and neurologist and neuroscience kind of forum together. And uh, the meeting in Glasgow was marvelous, and the meeting in, uh, uh, in Montreal, I'm sure, will be just as good. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Um, uh, <coughs> You have a patient advocacy forum. Um, it would be good to, um, you know, to hear from you uh, or the, the patient advocacy forum about what people like me, researchers like me, could do to uh, uh, to, to put the word out and and to, to fix problems in terms of communication and, and feedback uh, uh, where, where you see that there is a problem. I, I'd be, we'd be very interested to hear more. Great. Thank you very much. We're running over. I hope you'll forgive us. This is a very rich subject, and I will take the editorial privilege of giving it just four or five more minutes. Uh, first of all, a comment, and then a, a one more question of Dr. Farah. A couple of people just wrote in, Dr. Farah, and I will take the liberty of answering this, and you'll tell me if I'm wrong, saying they thought, you heard, they, thought they heard you say that you don't get Parkinson's until age 60 or 70. I believe uh, the answer to that is, to whoever wrote this, actually the two or three of you, that, uh, that Dr. Farah was referring to the average age or the median age, which is yeah. indeed um, at the late, late 60s or early 70s, and that, of course, there are many people who are diagnosed later than that and many, many people who are diagnosed much earlier. I think there are 10% diagnosed before the age of 50. So um, he was just referring, I think, to the average or the median. Is that correct? That, that's, no, yeah, the median age is a statistical term, but, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a very broad range. Our youngest patient is seven years of age, to give you an example, and our oldest is probably in their uh, mid-80s. Mm. Um, yes. Thank you. Last question. I love this one. Why did you go into this field? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah. Um, well, I've been in it for a while, but I, I'm very interested in brain and brain function, and I'm, I'm very uh, interested, obviously, in genetics. And I, and I thought to myself, you know, there is no better approach, I think, in, in looking at the human brain than looking at genetics because you can you can get access to the information you need, uh, the root causes of the problem, um, basically without taking a biopsy. People with brain disorders don't you know are already suffering enough uh, in terms of their cognitive ability or, or movement ability or whatever, and uh, you can't take biopsies of living people of, of brain tissue. So I, I thought this is a wonderful combination. I um I got engaged in this uh, very early. Um, by in actually working in psychiatric hospitals uh, when I was a child and, uh, and seeing how disabling the medications were uh, to those patients who were in long-term care in psychiatric hospitals and, uh, and how little um, efficacy they had and how you know, just basically how disabling they were to those individuals. And, uh, um, and I thought there's got to be a better way uh, than, than this. Uh, most medications are not developed around the cause of the problem. They're developed around the symptoms. 
And uh, so I've been basically applying my skills of that since I was a teenager and, uh, and going into this route. That's a wonderful way to end this. And thank you so much for the uh, privilege. You've really done us, done us proud, done us all proud, and we're all very, very grateful. Oh, uh, it's, it's well, the other way around. <laughs> <Good. without the laughs> I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, a couple of uh, uh, more announcements, if I may. First of all, um, uh, there is a wonderful article uh, in the in the very well, extremely well known Parkinson disease quarterly newsletter called the Parkinson Disease Foundation News and Review. It is in the winter 2012 issue. That's two issues ago, and the author is one Dr. Matthew Ferrer. So, if you want more from the same source and didn't exhaust your enthusiasm with this terrific talk. Uh, if you haven't got up, uh, if you're on our mailing list and don't have the newsletter, uh, email us or call us, and of course we'll send you the article. And I think you'll find it as enriching and informative as I did. Um, a few other public service announcements. If you haven't already done so, please look at the online survey. It should be on your screen. I'm informed. Uh, we really, really, really use the feedback on these webinars to ensure that we plan well in the future. We don't just pick randomly. We go on the basis of the need, the expressed need, how long ago we did something, how well we did it, and how we could then improve it. And all of those uh, questions go into this, and your feedback is terribly important in that regard. So please, before you leave, I think it takes you about a minute and a half probably to do it, but please do it. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, a thank you again to our terrific corporate sponsors for this uh, series that we're now beginning with the genetics uh, uh, story. Uh, Abbott Laboratories and Teva Neuroscience, uh, two model companies in the, uh, in the promotion of public awareness in our field, and we're extremely uh, glad to work with them and welcome their financial support that uh, really does uh, make this whole thing possible. Um, for those of you who would like or those of you who have friends who would like, there's an archive of the event. I think you're probably familiar with this at this point. And it will be available one week from now on Tuesday, October 2nd. Just go to www.pdf.org. Uh, we will send you an email when it's available so that you can listen to it again, let your friends know about it. Uh, please um, note in your calendars, your diaries, um, a, um, uh, the second in our series, in our current series, which will be on Tuesday, November 20th, at the same time, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern U.S. time. Um, and the subject will be caregivers and Parkinson's, and the speaker will be uh, Julie Carter, one of the most experienced RNs in the field and professionals generally in our field um, from the University of Oregon, and she will be leading that. So uh, we'll all look forward to that one. Um, so, I'm uh, again, I want to thank uh, Dr. Farah for this uh, wonderful talk and uh, reducing one of the most difficult subjects to uh, manageable bites uh, and uh, edible and digestible bites. Uh, we're very, very grateful for this, and we are, of course, very grateful to all of you who've joined us for this whole show and are, um, I'm sure, the richer for this experience. Thank you again, Dr. Farah. Thank you, everybody, and uh, enjoy your autumn season, and we'll be, I hope, uh, speaking to you again very soon. Bye-bye. Okay.